I saw the movie, The Crow, opening night, Man's Chinese Theater. It was like my third week in L.A. And my friends took me to see the film. Sitting, I walk in, and we expected the, the theater to be totally deserted because it, it seemed to me like a fairly obscure, almost art house film. The theater is packed. I was so enthralled with the first Crow. It was deeper than most movies, in a way, because you were dealing with life and death and that kind of sorrow and loss. And I thought it was very, uh, it was very touching. I was immediately impressed during the film by the, the look of the film and Brandon Lee's performance, which was incandescent, absolutely lit from within. I happened to be at the, the first public screening, and it struck me that the kids in this audience, afterwards I was listening to them talk, and one of the kids said, finally, somebody made a film for us. We knew getting into a second picture that we would be stepping on a, a really cherished film and, and character in a manner in which we felt we had to, in a sense, improve, if it was at all uh, possible, uh, and better ourselves. Really, the mandate for this film was make it the same but different. Nobody wants them to retread or just, you know, Bigger explosions just aren't, aren't going to do it, you know. There, there has to be something fresh brought to the story. Um, it has to expand in some way. Um, you know, otherwise there's no reason to continue it. When I went online with all the fans of the first movie, the thing that everybody said was, well, it can't be Eric Draven, it can't be Eric Draven. As long as it's not Eric Draven, you know, we'll watch a new story. And once I assured them that it wasn't Eric Draven, then they were all interested. You know, basically the elements that we kept were that somebody had to die a violent death and that they had to lose someone that they loved in the, in the process of that death. And we didn't want to tell just the story of a man who lost his lover again. So in this instance, we thought, well, what's the only thing that could possibly be more heart-wrenching than, you know, somebody losing his fiance? And then we thought, well, that would be, you know, somebody losing his child. And so that's kind of the genesis for... Uh, our new character Ash to come back in this movie. I sort of thought, well, where can you where can you really take it from from here? And then I basically came up. What what interested me about the idea was that um, that we could create. I, I was really into. I thought something they hadn't really gone into in the last movie was what it felt like to be the character. What what if you really were dead? And so then it struck me the way to do that, the way to really highlight who he was, was to create something of a drama with a love story. I mean, it was obvious that that kind of the gothic romance is a huge element of the first movie but if you look at it really the the romantic element of the first film takes place in the past and what we decided to do was make the romance in this film take place in the present so we then had to create a a love story and an unrequited love story between Ash, who's come back from the dead and Sarah who's an adult I think there's something really passionate about that and the whole notion of her being in love with something that's dead is really interesting and the fact that their love is so alive and so pure the juxtaposition between the two is really interesting i saw you drowning you and your son how did i survive you didn't you're dead no! No! You know, i really declined to be involved with this production, you know, from the writing end of it, because I was such good friends with Brandon uh, that every time I, I sat down to write something, you know, it just, Brandon was like right in front of me on the page. Um, every time I went to go write something for, for the character, um, you know, I was thinking, well, how would Brandon deliver this line? And so I just, I just, I couldn't do it. Well, I think the casting of, 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 of the new Crow character as such was one of the most important decisions because whatever happened, he would be compared to Brandon Lee, if you like, because people have so much love for him. So I knew that whoever we cast would have to be, I thought, very different. So at first I probably met up with two or three hundred people, and they were all great people. It's just that some of them seemed to come from the point of view they would be son O Brandon or brother O Brandon, and I just thought that was a bad decision. So I then saw Vincent in this film, Lauren, there's this one moment where he is looking out of this window and there's firelight that lights his face and then he he pulls back into the shadows uh, so that he won't be seen and it's a moment that's so crow-esque if you will that uh, I saw that moment 
and I was with Tim at the time, and we knew he was the guy. I think I feel a little bit shy, you know, regarding that. I feel a little bit shy, especially uh, after uh, Brandon Lee. He was good. He was very good. He was a good actor. So. Uh, but you said yourself, this is a different story. Too. Yeah, yeah, but it's you know, it's the crow. Brandon had this kind of electric, electrical physicality about him, and Vincent, uh, I don't know, the camera just seems to be drawn to Vincent for some reason. He's uh, just a, a really strong presence on the screen. But they both had this odd, strange kind of androgynous sensuality to them that, I mean, for some reason, both men and women seem to like both of them. But I think what's interesting about the character as well is that he's not your average sort of rippling muscled action hero and that he has a feminine quality to him and I think that's what appealed to a lot of people about The Last Crow. I mean basically to put it bluntly you have a guy in drag you know running around. I guess I'll be you know uh, doing men in black lipstick for the rest of my life now. This character is much less um, of a kung fu fighter or whatever the term is. He's a lot less hard like this. But he goes through a lot of um, physicality, and I thought Vincent would be able to bring a physicality to the movie. Action. <laughs> Been jumping a lot. <laughs> um, it's okay, that's not the most difficult, you know. Let's let's face it, I mean, like, it's like uh, you have to take pleasure of that, you know. Suddenly you're sort of going back into your childhood. Vincent, you all right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My God, like one week on Monday I drowned him. Tuesday I dragged him across the back lot for several hours, like by a rope around his neck. Um, Thursday I hung him, and Friday I, we whipped the shit out of him when he was being hung. Remind me the scene? Yeah. 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 That's my truck. I try. <laughs> I'm gonna cheat also, you know. I think that's the way to do it. I know whenever I've done those rigs. Have you done these rigs before? Have you ever done anything like this rig? Never. Because whenever I've worked with them, it's good is to sort of put your head back and to fight with your back, yeah, you know, yeah. which is which is really, you did really hard work. You did that? I haven't done it personally, but I've worked with people and I've encouraged them to do that. Oh yeah? Yeah. I felt that the villains in the first movie were really spectacular, particularly Michael Wincott. Really a movie like this, a genre movie, whether it be Batman or The Crow or Superman or anything like that, they're only as good as their villains. So in this film, we had to construct a kind of group of villains that were as colorful. I'm not gonna sit here with a fucking target on my chest. I'm gonna take this motherfucker out. Well, I've been a huge fan of Iggy Pops forever. You know, I really wanted them in the first film, but for various reasons, he couldn't be in it. I've known Iggy for about 10 years, and he was like, for me, was like, and I know for Alex McDowell, um, just like a teen idol as such, you know. He was just like, he was the grandfather of punk, which was the music we all, we all grew up on. I've seen Iggy in concert like 15 times, and I really liked, uh, you know, all the, uh, the kind of neo-ballet things that he did, and, uh, just the, the the pure energy that he brought to everything. There was a wildness to his music, which I don't I know I don't hear these days. Even when people tell me it is, I don't believe it. So I thought if we could get him into the movie, that would be a great thing. I laced these some references, some not so veiled references to some of his songs in the description, in the narration of the script, and he he picked up on it. And it's the first thing he said when he met me. Is, is there's this you know. It, describes this one character as, you know, I want to be your dog, which is one of his songs. And I was just kind of hoping to subliminally influence him to take the role. 
but uh, once he came on board, then we, we worked together and made it kind of uniquely Iggy. People have for years wanted to see him in a role which would show him off to his best. That's my view. I've always wanted to see a movie. You know, we've all seen flashes of him in movies, but never quite seen the true Iggy. Well, you know, considering that I do things like have my balls set on fire, get thrown in a pond right, and drowned, uh, and snort huge lines of black cocaine from the top of a motorcycle adorned with a naked blonde chick being fucked in the ass by death. It was a stretch. <laughs>
you are deaf and it's drunk. You're drunk in your death, you have to be drunk. And then this music builds, it's beautiful, this music is built, it's sort of psychedelic sort of thing. It says the things are going okay, to you let's you try fall. one. It'd be amazing. Okay, everybody moving! Okay, go Vincent. Action! Graffiti in LA is so familiar like in all cities, so it, what we decided to do was to remove graffiti wherever we saw it and replace it with our own. So very early on I, I contacted a designer called David Carson who uh, designs a magazine called Raygun and his, one of his kind of design obsessions is how far can you push legibility and how far can you advance out, you know, the typography to the point where people can just about read it and get it. Um, and at the same time I was looking at 60s Chicano gang graffiti, 60s, 70s kind of, very, uh, where it had developed to a point where it really was illegible, it was its own code, codified language. So I got him together with, with this um, reference material that I had found, asked him to design a typeface. And he came up with something really fast that was absolutely appropriate. It was that based on some kind of alphabet, every now and again you can recognize a letter. And then what we did was pass it on to this local tagger called Ricardo. On the whole, he single-handedly went into areas, you know, 300 feet of, of a running concrete bridge and within a day had graffitied the whole thing. We decided that the first movie had a lot of rain and that what we would use as our metaphor for kind of the unconscious would be uh, just smog. So there's this ever-present pall throughout the film, and we weren't going to have any rain in the course of the movie. And it's a challenge that's never really been a film shot at night that doesn't use water as an element for reflection. It's just a classic thing. But when we were scouting downtown locations, a very recurrent image to me was just broken glass all over the place. So early on I decided that we could use broken glass to do the same thing as water, but it would have a far more potent narrative kind of message in it. We decided on a palette that, that came from sodium light. Um, the kind of idea that street light is the light of the city, there's no exterior light, there's never any moon, that we've got this blanket of smog over the whole city, so um, nothing penetrates that. And, our logic in the broad stroke was that the street lights bounce into the smog and filter back down into the city. You know, the lighting of the film is sort of this sulfur yellow that sort of looks like people's skin is like jaundiced and set on fire. And, you know, once you're in the lighting and you see all this broken glass and these, you know, remnants of these old cars and it's very, very easy to slip into the character in the world. The production designer has to provide a framework for the characters in the film. I think that's primarily it. It's that and controlling the look of the film from start to finish. You have to kind of live in the film. You have to do this kind of method design thing where you put yourself inside each character's head one by one and you kind of invent a backstory for them that's not necessarily described in the script in order to give yourself the background that you need to, to um, in this case in Sarah, to find out why she's in this space and what she would put in this space. We kind of built a story where she, she lives out of two suitcases, doesn't live anywhere more than six to eight months, you know, keeps moving so her, her property is absolutely minimal and therefore what she's moved into here, there's not a, a piece of furniture here that, that we're saying that she bought or brought off the street or anything, she just moves into a place and inhabits it disturbs it as little as possible, puts her own pieces, you know, her own um, life into it where she needs to. That's the example, I think, is that we just, we, we just build a backstory. I think that a lot of the people that watch The Crow were the kind of kids like I was when I was a kid who were maybe um, out of the mainstream for one reason or another, you know, didn't, they weren't the jocks, they weren't, you know, the super brains kind of thing. They were the, the kids that slipped between the cracks, but I think there's actually a, 
really a majority of those kids, but nobody realizes that they're a majority. They're kind of a hidden majority. I think the audience of the crew is really cool, and they're extremely intelligent. They know what they want, and, you know, delivering the goods plus more is what makes the film really exciting to do.